Morning, hello. It's my pleasure to introduce the roundtable Open Science and Phonetics. Um, this roundtable is related to three projects um, on forensic phonetics. The first one is research cooperation in speech science with a special attention to forensic and speech therapy applications, financed by uh, the Swedish um, research agents and the uh, CAPES uh, Brazilian research agents. The second project is Pela Excelência do Ensino e Pesquisa em Forensic Forensic financed by CAPES, and the third one is the FAPESP project that helped us to start uh, work on, on that in, in Brazil in terms of teaching and research, análise fonética acústica e elaboração de protocolo para comparação de locutor em casos forenses. Our first talker will be Professor Anders Eggson from Stockholm University, and he is the Sweden side coordinator of the first project. The second presenter uh, will be Granata Passetti, who is a postdoc uh, uh, in the Pontifical, Pontifical Catholic University of São Paulo, and he is, she is a postdoc of the second project. The third presenter will be Julio Cavalcanti, uh, doing his postdoc uh, in a few months in Stockholm University, and his postdoc of project one, and myself, which who uh, will be the mediator of this table, uh, uh, who is um, uh, the Brazil side the coordinator of the first project and the coordinator of the second project. The themes that we'll be discussing today uh, are first a view and a position on the conflicting trends between demands for data sharing in open science and regulations of personal data protection. Then you ask, uh, does forensic phonetics fit in open science practices because of data confidentiality and uh, the possibilities for research and teaching? Then we'll be presenting a case of a twin study where sensitive data is concerned, but research collaboration is possible through metadata sharing. And after that, I will have uh, I close with some words as regards regulations from the National Committee of Ethics in Brazil in research and the UNICA Public Repository for Data Management. Then uh, you have the word on this piece and thank you. Just tell me when you want me to start talking. Um, it looks okay, I'm just waiting for someone to say that I can start giving my presentation. Yes, please. Okay, fine. So my name is Anders Eriksson. I'm a professor of phonetics at Stockholm University. And my talk will be about sharing recorded speech data versus speaker identity protection. I can't change the slides. What's happening? It doesn't work for me to change the slides. Why is that so? What's wrong? Yeah, Could someone help me to tell me what's wrong? Well, uh, William, você pode ajudar o Andres? O slide não está passando. Do you still see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. I'll do it from this window. Sorry. All right. So the topic of this roundtable is on open science, in particular when applied to forensic speech science. But most of the questions concerning open science are the same for other types of research. It therefore makes sense to begin with a more general description of the problem. There is no generally agreed upon definition of open science, but the following definition copied from Wikipedia 
may serve as a representative view. Make science, scientific research, including publications, data, physical samples, and software, and its dissemination accessible to all levels of inquiry, inquiring society, amateur or professional. That this is sort of a maximum version of open science. I will begin by saying a few words about accessibility of publications, what we refer to as open access publication, which may also be seen as a kind of data sharing. This type of publishing would be the norm if it were not for the cost. It's simply much too expensive for the individual author. And here are some examples. There are typical open access fees you have to pay for these journals in order for your publications to be, uh, be accessible with open access. The first journals are hybrid publications, which means that you can publish in these journals, in Journal of Phonetics, for instance, but if you don't pay the fee for open access, it will just only be published in the paper. It should be obvious by looking at this table that such prices are far too high for the individual researcher to pay pay for without support from the home university or the research funding. And in this case, if they don't have that kind of support, open access publishing is just not accessible to these authors, these researchers. Why open science? There are many questions to this, but I've listed five important points that you may, may consider when we are talking about open science. To provide data for large-scale meta-studies, combine data from many different sources to a large meta-database. This is very common in medical research. To make it possible to check published results against the data they are based on. To make it possible to use existing data for new studies. To make it possible to share data with other researchers. And to make data possible to use in education. The methods applied in forensic phonetic casework have almost without exception been, de been developed and tested on speech data with no immediate connection to crime. And as I will show with examples from our own research, it is not unusual that databases creating for completely different purposes than forensic application turn out to be useful in forensic speech research as well and even forensic casework. Some 20 years ago, I was one of the principal investigators for a large-scale dialect project called Swedia 2000. During the summer of 1999, we recorded dialect speakers of Swedish in 107 locations in Sweden and Finland. Altogether, about 1,300 speakers were recorded. The resulting database was made available for other researchers by request. Today, there are more than 100 publications based on data from this database, including several doctoral theses. But the most important factor here is not the number of publications, but the fact that many of them, and in particular doctoral theses, would not have been possible at all if it were not for the availability of this extensive database. The total funding for the project, recording the data and preparing it for use in scientific research, was approximately 3 million US dollars. For obvious reasons, this is way beyond the resources of any individual researcher, researcher let alone a doctoral student. Most of the studies concerned uh, concern aspects of dialectology, but it's worth mentioning that the reference database for forensic purposes is based on a subset of this database. This subset has been extensively used in forensic casework. There is obviously no way this type of use could have been anticipated at the time of creating the database. And I will come back to this question in the later in my talk. Another subset of the data with short samples from the database is made completely open for use at all levels of education. It's extensively used for this purpose. And here is the opening page. What's going on?
Uh, may I talk? Ah, sim. Sim. Uh, may I have the word and, uh, and say to, to, to the persons listening to us that, yes, thank you. Um, um, I'm sorry for that technical problem, but it seems that some kind of problem in Sweden <laughs> is going on. It's uh, right. The connection yeah. crashed. Okay. Uh, you are back. You are back, and as you can, you All right. can share Sorry again. about that. There was nothing I could do. It just crashed. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, here is the opening, pa opening page of the Open Science Education Database. Uh, it's a map of... You, 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 you need uh, some person that need to put uh, on, the, on this presentation or on screen again. Is that so? Okay. William, can you put the presentation of him in the air, please, for favor, again? Just so you, you can't see my presentation. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, yes. I am I'm asking all right, you. All right, all right, all right. Yes. Let's see what I can do about yes. that. There, share screen. Yes, yes, please. PowerPoint presentation. Live. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does it work now? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, here's the front page of the Open Science Education Database. And the, the page shows a map of Sweden, the green one, and parts of Finland. And each of the red dots point to a recording location. And by clicking on one of the dots, you are taken to a new page where you can listen to four different uh, examples of dialectal speech from that particular uh, location. And it's widely used at all levels of education uh, in Sweden. I would like to show another example of data sharing of a somewhat different database. Since 2011, we have been involved in a project studying lexical stress in both production and perception in the following languages, Swedish, English, Estonian, French, Italian, and Brazilian Portuguese. Data have been recorded in three different speaking styles, spontaneous dialogue, phrase reading, and word list reading. The studies have so far resulted in 7 scientific publications. 13 of these studies focus on production and perception of lexical stress. But we have also produced four studies in forensic phonetics. The systematic variation in language and speaking style turned out to be just right for studies of some fundamental aspects of speaker comparison for forensic purposes. Again, the use of the data for forensic studies was not part of the, the original plan, but arose from the need for suitable data in a completely different context. Right now we are experiencing two conflicting trends. There is an increasing demand for public access to research data. More and more journals encourage authors to upload data used in the analysis described in the manuscript. At the same time, there are increasing restrictions on the content of open access data based on personal integrity concerns. The General Data Protection Regulations, GDPR, adopted in the European Union and similar regulations in other countries are examples of such restrictions. So here is the sort of the main points of this GDPR uh, endeavor. This regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. And this regulation protects fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons, in particular their right to the protection of personal data. And it's also concerned with the free movement on, of personal data within the Union, given that you follow the recommendations in point one and two. Natural person, also sometimes referred to as a physical person, is a concept used to identify an individual human being. This is different from a legal person, which can be a legal representative of some activity or a company. GDPR only applies to natural persons. The regulations affect the handling of personal data in a very broad sense, and here is a broad description of what they're are, the regulations are uh, meant to control. 
rapid technological developments and globalization have brought new challenges to the protection of personal data. Technology allows both private companies and public authorities to make use of personal data on an unprecedented scale in order to pursue their activities. But they also make it clear that whatever is said in the regulations in general apply to scientific data as well. So where personal data are processed for scientific research purposes, this regulation should also apply to that processing. So uh, in the broadest possible sense for a technical development, fundamental research, applied research, and privately funded research. For personal data processed for statistical purposes, this regulation should apply to that processing also. It seems to me, uh, to you, perhaps that 159 and 62 say the same thing, but the last paragraph is about processing data uh, collected by other resources for statistic, uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, investigations. In the following, I will give a brief overview of some key issues related by GDPR and use the two databases I just described to illustrate if and how GDPR may affect future work of this kind. So we start with personal data. And personal data are defined as any information relating to an identify or identifiable natural person, directly or indirectly. And in direct in the identifiers may be something like identification number, location data, only online identifiers, and so on. But there are also what they call indirect identifiers. And these identifiers are identifiers like telephone numbers, credit card numbers, bank account numbers, number plates of your car. But these differ from the direct identifiers in that for instance, telephone numbers could be common for several different persons. Uh, uh, bank accounts could also be accessible by and belong to several jointly by uh, to several different persons. So these identical uh, indirect identifiers are less uh, valuable if you want to track uh, uh, the identity of a given individual, which is the case in say, forensic casework. One way of interpreting this is that personal data are added to the database when processing the data. A hotly debated uh, question is therefore, if an unprocessed recording is a case of personal data. My re many researchers say yes, and I disagree, and we can come back to this during the discussions. Personal data in forensic casework. To illustrate one of the differences between scientific research in general and forensic casework, I would like to direct your attention to the fact that in scientific research, personal identifiers are problematic for integrity reasons. Whereas in forensic casework, connecting identifiers to a given personal individual is often the very purpose of the analysis. And GDPR uh, uh, recognize this difference. So they make an exception for forensic casework under certain circumstances. This regulation does not apply to the processing of personal data by competent authorities for the purposes of the prevention, investigation, detection or prosecution of criminal offenses or the execution of criminal penalties, including the safeguarding against the prevention of threats to public security. So it means that if you are doing forensic casework, you do not have to follow the recommendations and the rules in the GDPR uh, meant to protect uh, individuals. And it doesn't only apply to large organizations, it applies even to individuals doing forensic forensic casework for the police. The GDPR regulations do not consider anonymized data at all, except to say in regulations section 26, the truly anonymous data are outside the realm of the GDPR and as a consequence are not affected by the regulations. So they say the principles of data protection should therefore not apply to anonymous information. This regulation does not therefore concern the processing of such anonymous information, including for statistical research purposes. And this is good for us because normally we don't have uh, databases in our research at least not the data we use for uh, publications, 
that are uh, not anonymized. So we are calling speakers, speaker one, speaker two, speaker three, and names and, all, and other identifiers are never used in our database, uh, which are for the uh, publications. The GDPR regulation does not consider anonymous data at all, but what is defined, however, is something called pseudonymization. And it's defined as follows. It means the processing of personal data in such a manner that the personal data can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject without the use of additional information, provided that such additional information is kept separately. Now, what that means is not absolutely clear what the additional information means. It's often suggested that you can make the personal data accessible in encrypted form that can be accessed using a password only given to trusted co-workers. Consent is important. If you want to use the data, you should get the consent of the people involved in, in the data, uh, either as speakers or as listeners in perception experiments. So where processing is based on consent, the controller should be able to demonstrate that the data subject has consented to the processing of his or her personal data. And controller in this case means the, uh, the investigator, the principal investigator. And it should be formulated, written in using clear and plain language. Uh, when the, the processing has multiple purposes, consent, consent should be given for, to, for all of them. And this is a problematic point because as I already shown you, it often happens that the, uh, the, the data become useful for something completely unforeseen when the data were uh, collected. For the recordings in the production studies, we have been using written consent forms that subjects are asked to sign if they agree that the recording can be used for scientific research, often but not always explained in some detail. The following forms were used in the lexical stress study. In case of disagreement, the recordings were deleted. So they, we asked for their consent immediately after the recording, and if, if they did not agree uh, to these conditions, we simply deleted the, the recordings. And these are two consent forms. They are identical in every form, except they, in, they are in different languages. So the, the right, the left-hand one is in English, and the other one is in French. And this is important. Consent forms should always be in the native language of the participants in order to minimize the risk of misunderstandings of, of the conditions. For the perception test, we used a slightly different approach. So right in the beginning of the, when they have logged in and uh, considered if they wanted to be, uh, participate in the uh, experiment, they met with this text. As we have explained above, your participation will be anonymized. We do, however, need your, some background information in order to be able to compare results from different groups of participants. The personal information we need from you is sex, age, and native language. We also ask you to rate your knowledge of other languages than your own. If you agree to these conditions, then click proceed. If you do not agree, then click quit. And if they click proceed, then the experiment starts. If they click quit, they just leave the experiment and no data is, uh, is uh, uh, saved. To be able to withdraw previous consent at any time is an obligatory requirement in the GDPR reg regulations. The data subject should have the right to withdraw his or her concern, consent at any time. The withdrawal of consent should not affect the lawfulness of processing based on consent before the withdrawal. Prior to give, given consent, the data subject should be informed thereof. It should be as easy to withdraw as to give consent. This requirement is usually not the problem. Those who do want to participate usually say so immediately after the recording or perception test, that is before any use of the data has occurred at all. But if withdrawals occur after publishing papers, based on the data, it would mean that future analysis would not be entirely comparable to the previous ones. A word of warning. If a participant asks to withdraw his or her consent, this means that the corresponding data can no longer be used in new analysis. It does not, however, mean that the data should be deleted. 
It is a common misunderstanding that withdrawal requires delete or de data deletion. This is not true. The original data should always remain untouched. It's only the use of the data that may be changed. Now some uh, summary and some conclusions. In my analysis of the possible future con consequences of GDPR and similar restrictions, I've done so with typical, typical work in phonetics, including forensic phonetics, in mind. In doing so, I find the consequences rather limited. The reason for this is that personal information by which a participant may be identified, which is what GDPR is concerned with, is seldom needed in forensic research. In the dialect project, we obviously knew the name, address, and telephone number, etc., of the speakers. Without this kind of information, planning the recordings would not be possible. But when this had been done, personal information of this kind was no longer of any use. In the database, speakers are identified by impersonal codes. Social linguistic data, like, like sex, age, educational uh, backgrounds necessary for social linguistic research, is available by request, a case of pseudonymization before the concept even existed. The requirement, requirement meaning that the subject must be informed in quite some detail about the kind of studies the data will be used for, however, is quite problematic. As I've illustrated in my examples, data can often be fruitfully used for studies impossible for, to foresee at, time, at the time of collecting the data. Finally, it is important to point out that legislation like the, the GDPR does not apply retroactively. GDPR went into effect on April 27, 2016, and anything produced before that date is completely unaffected by the GDPR rules. And by that, I end my presentation and give the floor to the next speaker. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Anders. Renata, please, you can, you can prepare to your presentation. Okay, so good morning to my colleagues and to everyone watching this round table. My name is Renata and in this talk I will discuss the place of forensic phonetics research in open science by sharing some possibilities that are based on the experience of our research group. So here is my email contact. This presentation is outlined as follows. First, I will discuss the advantages of using material from real life casework in teaching and research on forensic phonetics and why we need to be careful with this material. Then, I will share some possibilities of forensic phonetics contributions to open science by presenting the aims and results of two scientific projects developed by our research group. And finally, I will close my talk with final remarks to shed light on this question. Does forensic phonetics fit in open science practices? But before I properly start discussing these topics, I'd like to clarify what will be the basis of my talk. So the possible contributions of forensic phonetics to open science will be illustrated based on the experience of teaching and research on forensic subjects from our research group, the Forensic Phonetics Studies Group based at Unicamp. This experience comes from educational courses, workshops, lectures, and joint research. The Forensic Phonetics Studies Group is headed by Professor Plinio Barbosa 
and was officially established in 2016. Although the study supervised by Professor Plinio on forensic phonetics date earlier than that, but it was in 2016 that Jeff was included in the Language Studies Institute's Hall of Research Groups. Our group has produced four PhDs in linguistics, and there is currently a new generation of researchers coming up. Jeff has also developed studies in collaboration with professors from Unicamp and other institutions, and with forensic experts from different Brazilian forensic agencies. Professor Anders Eriksson and Dr. Giulio Cavalcanti are among the researchers in this collaborative network. However, most of the studies developed, developed by our group uses lab speech. The main reasons for such a choice are, firstly, because we need a systematic control of our variables. For example, if we intend to study the telephone transmission effect or noise effect on a speech signal, we have to design, to design a controlled experiment to isolate our object of study and analyze it without external interference. interference. Secondly, because we usually don't have access to real casework material, as they are legally protected due to their confidential content. So by adopting this procedure, on the one hand, we can understand the underlying mechanisms of speech issues that forensic phonetics has to deal with. On the other one, our outcomes do not completely reflect reality. But what would be the advantages to using real-life casework material? We could better comprehend the Brazilian forensic reality, and by knowing this reality, we could select robust, robust acoustic parameters resistant to real-life conditions and to technical and linguistic effects commonly found in forensic casework. That way, we could develop teaching materials, tutorials, and phonetic acoustic scripts suited to the ends and demands of the Brazilian forensic public agencies. But there are also some disadvantages to use this type of material. The main one, as I already mentioned, is related to the confidential nature of the material. So, even if the research team has permission to analyze real-life casework material, most of the time, no data and metadata from it can be shared. So, how to deal with this? To answer this question, I will share two possibilities of how forensic phonetics can contribute to open science. These possibilities come from two collaborative research programs between our research group and a group of researchers and forensic experts. The first one was a collaborative research program with the Persecution Service of Sao Paulo State, and it was funded by FAPESP. And the second one is an ongoing project developed at the Academic Cooperation Program in Public Security and Forensic Sciences, funded by CAPS. The first research project was titled Acoustic Phonetic Analysis and Elaboration of a Protocol for Speaker Comparison in Forensic Case. And it was developed in collaboration with the Higher School of the Persecution Service of Sao Paulo State. The research team was coordinated by Professor Plinio Barbosa and Professor Ana Carolina Constantini. And we also had the contribution of two forensic experts from the Persecution Service of Sao Paulo State. This project aimed at proposing a protocol of forensic analysis for experts working for, for the Persecution Service of Sao Paulo State as well as for other professionals in forensic phonetics. To achieve that, we have analyzed parallel recordings of both forensic and live speech by means of three main techniques, perceptual, sociophonetic, and acoustic phonetic. 
The forensic data came from recordings from five forensic cases from the Persecution Service of Sao Paulo State Database. And the lab speech data came from close copies of these recordings in high signal to noise ratio conditions and their acoustically degraded versions to simulate real life conditions. The protocol resulting from this analysis was based on Ericsson's 2012 Five Steps of Oral Acoustic Analysis process, presented in the first column. So, for each step, we have proposed a systematic way of analyzing the phonetic aspects, which have involved the development of broad scripts, perceptual scales, transcription conventions, and instruction files presented in the second and third columns. So, for example, for the first step, careful listening to split material, we have proposed a set of scales based on perceptual as well as visual aspects to analyze the acoustic quality of split samples. These scales are presented in column B. So the presence of background noises is an example of a perceptual criteria and the visualization of fundamental frequency curve is an example of a spectrogram related slash visual criteria. And based on these scales, we can assign a label to the recording which will define what kind of analysis is suggested for each recording of the speech material. So, this perceptual and visual criteria in column B can be graded in preset scales presented in column C, except for a signal to noise ratio that you have to calculate. And the resulting combination will be used to assign a label that will define what kind of analysis is suggested for this recording. So there are five possible labels, ranging from the best to the worst acoustic qualities. And the, the possible labels are A, AB, B, BC, and C. The protocol results in seven instruction files, two Excel templates for acoustic quality and sociophonetic analysis, three tables with instructions and examples for transcription, sociophonetic analysis, and audio labeling, a correspondence table between ASCII and IPA for Brazilian Portuguese phones, and two Pratt scripts. The protocol is available to the academic community and you can scan this QR code to access it. The outcomes of this project, as well as other subjects related to forensic phonetics, were published in a book from Editora Millennium, a Brazilian publishing company specialized in forensics, and we also have presented the protocol and its outcomes in forensic academic congresses in Brazil. The second research project is titled For the Excellence of Academic Education and Research in Forensic Phonetics. And it is a collaboration between researchers from three Brazilian universities, Unicamp, PUC São Paulo and PUC Rio Grande do Sul and two forensic public agencies, the Brazilian Federal Police and the Institute of Forensic Analysis of Rio Grande do Sul. So here is the research team on the left side, the coordinators and on the right side, the other researchers. This project has educational purpose, so its main goals are to provide professional qualification in forensic phonetics by means of academic courses, workshops, and webinars, and also to stimulate research. We have already conducted 
two academic courses, a workshop led by a forensic expert and a workshop, sorry, a webinar led by a forensic expert and a workshop on the usefulness of voice lineups in academic research. It's important to mention that all these activities are open to anyone who is interested and the next will be a webinar on Bayesian approach to forensic phonetics presented by a forensic expert of Federal Police. So if you are interested, you are welcome to join us. This pitch material for the activities and for the studies developed by this research program come mainly from two same spontaneous corpora. One of them was collected by the forensic expert from the National Institute of Criminalistics and has more than 300 100 recordings. And it's important to mention that even though this corpus was compiled by forensic experts, these recordings are not from real life caseworks, but rather from volunteers. The other one is Coral Brasil, a project coordinated by Professor Tomaso Razo and Professor Eliana Mello from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, with recordings from Minas Gerais State and from different speech contests. This is an open corpus and you can access all its content by this link. So, this second project aims, firstly, to consolidate forensic phonetics as an academic and a professional field in Brazil. Secondly, to stimulate the development of research in this area and of training programs. And last but not least, to highlight the importance of linguists and phoneticians as the best suited professionals to carry out speaker comparison tasks, since this professional qualification is still not accepted by most of the Brazilian forensic public agencies. So, does forensic phonetics fit in open science practices? In this talk, I have illustrated some possibility, possibilities of how forensic phonetics area can contribute with open science practices. These possibilities include the development of protocols, tutorials, and guidelines for speaker comparison tasks, scripts for computing forensic phonetic parameters, repositories with instruction files for speaker comparison steps, and the promotion of education by means of workshops, courses, webinars, and of course, applied research. So thank you very much for your attention. Here are the acknowledgments to the Brazilian research agencies and the references of the mentioned literature. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renata. Then we are ready for the last presenter. And then I will conclude the round table by showing some final remarks. Julie, we can prepare yourself for the presentation, please. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I guess everyone can see my screen now. Is that the case? Can I, can someone confirm? Yes, okay, okay. Let me just go back to my presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julio Cesar Cavalcanti. 
Um, and first of all, I would like to thank Abraline for this uh, amazing opportunity uh, for us to talk about something that is so uh, relevant nowadays, which is uh, open science, uh, specifically when it comes to its uh, implications on uh, forensic phonetics. So the title of my presentation is Open Science, Possibilities for Forensic Phonetics. And I'm going to first start by uh, mentioning some uh, very briefly some uh, open science concepts. And then as the title of my presentation suggests, I'm going to talk about possibilities that we have as researchers when trying to uh, open up our uh, research data. And then I'm going to uh, draw some brief comments on uh, whether all experimental material and data can be made available to the general public. Um, so I think it's important to highlight that open science is actually a rather uh, broad, comprehensive concept, and it, it actually applies to all stages of the workflow, as Anders uh, talked about in the beginning of his presentation. So we can talk about open methodology when referring to ways in which we can make our the description of our methods and the way we have analyzed our data more transparent for other uh, researchers so they can reuse that data and replicate it. We can talk about open source, and I could cite um, softwares that we often use uh, uh, in acoustic analysis, such as Pratt, and also in statistical analysis, such as uh, R, uh, with scripts that are put together by the, the collective. Uh, I could talk about open access and mention uh, places where we can make our publications and the outcomes of our publications uh, fully available to, to the public. And of course, uh, we can talk about open data, which is the main focus of our, uh, our, my today's uh, talk. And these are just to name a few. There are other concepts within this broader uh, concept or framework, work, which is open science. Um, and at, at some level, uh, what we all want to achieve um, by trying to open uh, uh, the research that we are carrying out or the, the process of making research is to achieve some level of transparency uh, regarding all aspects of our study. Um, in fact, that transparency should be the basis on which we make our decision uh, uh, such as when we propose guidelines for forensic speaker comparison and as more uh, the more transparent the process, the entire process is, the more reliable, the more robust will be uh, our guidelines and, and our decision making. Um, however, forensic phonetics is, is a special case and that's particularly one of the reasons why we are talking about it uh, here today. And why is that? Well, as Renata already uh, mentioned, in most cases, there are legal and practical obstacles on sharing real forensic data, either because data is not accessible for analysis, uh, because it is kept, in most cases, private by the police, and only um, the police and the expert, forensic experts that are an, uh, conducting an investigation, um, only then can have access to that data. And even in cases where the researcher, uh, uh, researchers are granted access to that material, it cannot simply be shared with the public because some legal restrictions apply. We often deal with non-collaborative individuals, so it's really hard to ask individuals to uh, say whatever we want them to say because sometimes they just don't want to incriminate themselves. So um, it's, it's, it's quite hard to... to um, analyze this, this type of material, sometimes they are just simply not enough. Uh, and as researchers, we have no control whatsoever regarding the conditions uh, in which uh, this kind of data um, are collected. So of course, there are some experimental strategies that we researchers can adopt when trying to replicate what happens in a real forensic case work uh, in the lab. And here I'm just going to mention a few. We can just recruit uh, normal individuals. I, by normal, I mean individuals who are not going through an investigation, um, regular individuals. And then we can 
ask them to speak in different uh, speaking styles so we can understand how the, the variable nature of speech. Um, we can try to look at the impact of transmission systems and channels such, channels, such as the mobile phone effect on, on the speech signal. We can uh, look at the impact of timing or the passing of time on the properties of speech by uh, analyzing non contemporaneous recordings. We can look at uh, the effects of different audio degradation factors such as noise, uh, audio compression. We can look at the impact of emotions uh, such as stress. We can also try to understand how individuals interact with someone they were quite familiar with and with someone they are not familiar uh, at all. And also we can try to understand how these guys affect um, the way we produce speech. And these are just to name uh, a few uh, strategies. And what are the ultimate goals regarding those strategies? Well, they all seek at some level to approximate the experimental and the real world forensic conditions, as well as help us understand how resistant and robust parameters may be in a given language and context, uh, namely how speaker specific they are, um, and also how intrinsic and extrinsic factors to speakers influence their linguistic behavior, such as the factors that I have already mentioned. But most importantly, uh, it's, it's, is that we, this kind of data can be, in most cases, made available to the scientific community. So uh, uh, scientists, they can reuse that data, reanalyze that data. So this is, uh, of course, of, a, of very uh, high importance for the, the progress of science. So now I'm going to talk about a research that I have conducted in which we have looked at um, uh, the level of robustness regarding some forensic parameters that are commonly assessed within the forensic setting. Uh, and for that, we try to look at it's a situation in the real world uh, where individuals look alike the most. And if we think that uh, that case is, is when we have identical twins, and that's because those individuals, they share approximately 100% of their genetic information. They often share um, uh, very similar, uh, uh, they were under the effects of very similar linguistic and environmental influences, what we expect uh, that should have some impact on their linguistic behavior. So we thought of this as the ideal situation, the, the, the optimal uh, context for us to, to test the level of robustness regarding parameters that are used in a forensic case. It's important to highlight that uh, studies have been conducted for other languages, such as English, for instance. And here I highlight the studies by Deborah Lopes, as well as Spanish. Um, and here we have uh, studies conducted by Eugenia Sansegundo. And ultimately, we also have studies um, for Brazilian Portuguese that has just been uh, published. So uh, the participants that we have recruited, they were 20 male speakers, namely 10 identical twin pairs, aged between 19 and 35 years old, coming from the same dialectal area, different backgrounds. Um, and those individuals, they were placed in two different rooms, so they could not directly see or hear each other. Uh, they were wearing a headset professional microphone and, and they were asked to talk to each other um, while they were uh, being recorded. And because all individuals, uh, they were talking to their twin brother, um, we can at least say that this uh, context is characterized by a high interspeaker familiarity which is very important and actually tries to uh, recreate one of the stages, one of the steps of the work uh, of the forensic um, setting in which individuals perform a telephone conversation and then uh, that uh, telephone uh, call is intercepted by, by the police. So we conducted uh, three larger experiments on that. One experiment looking at the discriminatory patterns of form and frequencies and then the discriminatory patterns of speech timing parameters. And finally, 
um, on the discriminatory patterns of fundamental frequency descriptors. So here we have the set of acoustic phonetic, phonetic parameters that we have assessed. Uh, we looked at the first four formant frequencies extracted from, from oral monotones in experiment number one. In experiment number two, we looked at speech timing parameters and those parameters can be grouped in three major or larger categories, namely macro, including speech rate and articulation rate, micro, um, including vowel duration and syllable duration, as well as pause-related parameters, including silent pulses duration and filled pulses. As for F0 parameters in experiment number three, those can be grouped in uh, also in three larger categories, namely centrality, extreme and baseline values of F0, variation and dispersion parameters, as well as modulation F0 parameters, which are related to the way we manipulate F0 in our speech, our F0 contour. And we did take into account the nature of this of the speech material that we have assessed, um, namely uh, connected speech versus lengthened vowels. So we tried to look at the, the discriminatory uh, patterns of the parameters uh, when we vary the, the nature of the of the material that we are using for analysis. We took into account different metrics for assessing the uh, discriminatory power, um, including the effect size, likelihood, likelihood ratio cost, which is an estimate or a metric that is often used uh, within uh, forensic uh, research, the equal error rate, receiver operating characteristic analysis, and I'll talk in very briefly about the, our main outcomes. We have seen that higher form and frequencies, uh, they tended to be more speaker discriminatory than lower form and frequencies, namely F3 and F4. However, F3 was the parameter or the form and frequency that best satisfied most conditions by presenting the desired properties of um, high true positives and uh, rates and low uh, false positive rates. As far as uh, the vowel quality is, is uh, concerned, we have observed that uh, vowels displaying a higher Euclidean distance, uh, higher Euclidean distances, and the acoustic space, they tended to be uh, more speaker discriminatory. And here we uh, highlight the, the only central vowel in Brazilian Portuguese, which is the vowel A and front vowels. We have also seen um, trends for stressed vowels as being slightly more discriminatory than unstressed vowels. However, uh, their combination uh, came out as much more explanatory of the, of the differences observed among individuals. And here we have just an example of how front and back vowels, they are um, distributed in the acoustic space. And we can see that um, back vowels in my uh, right hand side they tended to be, um, there, were, there, there was a high acoustic proximity, a high overlap for the, those vowels in comparison to front vowels. And in the paper that we have uh, published in, in an open access journal, we just invite this uh, dispersion or this difference re uh, regarding acoustic distances as uh, being on, on the basis or one of the reasons why we have more variation for one class than for the other. And here we also have um, uh, one example of how stressed and unstressed vowels are distributed in the acoustic space. Um, and we also uh, talk about how this variation and this dispersion may be related to a possibly higher or lower variation. Um, regarding experiment number two with speech timing parameters, uh, we have observed that parameters pertaining to the macro speech time category was the, the, the most, they were the most discriminatory, um, such as speech rate and articulation rate. On the other hand, macro speech timing parameters tended to be more stable and less variable across speakers. Um, and then we invite the hypothesis of a higher linguistic control on units such as vowels and syllables uh, duration. Furthermore, we observed um, that pause-related parameters was uh, the worst performing uh, category in terms of the discriminatory power. 
And something that is quite striking uh, and, and interesting is that we could, um, we noted that uh, there was a uh, discriminatory power asymmetry regarding different dimensions or acoustic phonetic dimensions. So parameters uh, deriving from the speech timing dimension tended to be less variable than parameters uh, pertaining to the spectral and melodic dimension that I will just describe uh, further. So here's just one example of how um, um, individuals, they vary in terms of macro and micro speech timing parameters. We have density curves and each curve represents an individual and individual dots represent uh, they represent the uh, means, individual means. And we can see that um, uh, for macro speech timing parameters, there is a slightly more uh, higher variation in those dots when compared to micro. Regarding experiment number three, uh, targeting F0 parameters, we have observed that F0 centrality measures uh, tended to outperform F0 modulation variation parameters, and that makes total sense if we take into account what the literature says uh, about the, uh, on the impacts of uh, speaking styles on the way we explore F0 and we modulate F0, we have seen that F0 baseline was the best discriminatory parameter, which is in, in good agreement with the, the literature. And we observed that in fact, uh, the nature of the speech material uh, matters as better discriminatory performance uh, was observed for F0 in connected speech in comparison to length net vowels. Uh, in fact, identical twins could only be contrasted uh, for uh, uh, connected speech. And here we have, again, just uh, one example of how variable individuals are regarding centrality and extreme values of F0 uh, in comparison to modulation and variation parameters. So um, further steps in order to deep our understanding of, of, of the data is to compare the same individuals speaking in a different speaking style. So we want to sort of re reconstruct what happens in a real forensic case and in which individuals are uh, uh, recruited or um, uh, they have to, to go through an interview, uh, normally uh, led by a police officer. And in this case, individuals will be talking to someone they are, they are not familiar with, which is the researcher. So we have a reduction of interspeaker familiarity. We will also perform uh, uh, the control over the conversation topic. And we look, uh, uh, we also want to uh, look at the inclusion and combination of all the parameters that we haven't had time to analyze before. So that being said, uh, there is a question that, that pops up and that we should ask ourselves, which is, does it mean all experimental data uh, can be made available to the general public? And based on our experience uh, when conducting this research, um, the answer for this question is not necessarily, perhaps no. And we have to think that the higher the ecological validity of the study, more likely it is that some restrictions may apply on sharing that research, uh, on that data with the general public. So if, if we just think about the amount of private and personal information that an individual can share when uh, speaking, uh, when performing, in, in performing an spontaneous dialogue with a peer that is so familiar to him or to her, and the amount of information that that, that person can share when just this person is asked to read sentences. We have a big asymmetry, a large asymmetry. So potential issues that we have found uh, in our study on sharing audio files is that when individuals, they are talking to someone that is so familiar to them and so related to them, they often tend to share personal information, but not only personal informa information about themselves, uh, as they also make reference to other subjects, uh, such as family members, friends, acquaintances, and they also tend to share sensitive information. So um, in here, we'd like to highlight the importance of human research ethics uh, committees on regulating that uh, uh, study and, when tr and trying to understand what can be and what cannot be 
uh, made available to, to the public. And also the research, us as researchers, we, we need to understand this important role that we have in, in uh, determining what can be made public and what cannot be made public. So in an, an ideal world, uh, we would say, and we should always aim for, that all raw material should be shared, including audio files. However, in some cases, this is just not possible. Uh, it, if we do that, we can put our participants uh, at risk, and, and we don't want that. Uh, however, something that we can do in all cases, or at least in most cases, is that we can provide the extracted parameters that we have obtained in our uh, study. So all the researchers, they can reuse that data, they can reanalyze it, and perhaps they can corroborate what we have found, or perhaps not, and then we have space for a, a very interesting discussion to be developed. And to finalize, I would like to quote this uh, passage from a very good uh, paper from Gerlich and, and, and colleagues, in which they, they state that research data need to be curated, archived, and made as open as possible and as closed as necessary. And these are my references. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for this presentation, Julio. And I will be ready for uh, the, the closing session, which will be some four slides for myself. And after that, I will talk about how a uh, uh, questions session will be working, okay? I'll be sharing my presentation. Okay. Uh, about, I will talk in just uh, two slides about uh, the situation at the University of Campinas about data sharing, data privacy. And we, as researchers and teachers at, at the university, um, from uh, I, I think last year on, uh, um, need to put all um, papers, metadata, and data by using links to data in permanent repositories in the uh, Unicamp repository. If, of course, no particular restrictions apply. This is an example of um, um, uh, uh, the actions of the university to make to make to make uh, data and all, all uh, steps of research as um, available for the general public and the researchers as possible. Okay, uh, together with uh, data share the the policies the of data sharing, data privacy at the university, we need, of course, to talk about our national committee for ethics and human research, and where we inform all steps of the research of data management and consent forms that Anders talked about uh, in his presentation. Of course, if necessary, we can include permission of voice and image use. This is an example of a consent form. Uh, there are other possibilities of uh, uh, wording, but this is one of the examples used uh, in research in Brazil, saying about the privacy of the data, that you are guaranteed that your identity, talk about the person that you signed the document, and data will be kept confidential, and that no information will be given to other people who are not part of the research team. And in the same consent form, it's saying that we emphasize that participation is voluntary and doesn't involve any type of cost, payment mm -hmm. of remuneration, because this is not possible in Brazil. Of course, metadata, if data can be shared to collaborators and the scientific community, if allowed by police after investigation ends in the case of forensic-based studies. Uh, some closing words about the two projects. Uh, this one uh, with collaboration with uh, Sweden, uh, with Anders, and will be ending by uh, 2022. And I would like to say that besides France Connect, this project also includes aspects concerning speech therapy and breathing and speech coordination. And it's a joint project between the Stockholm University and uh, our university at Campinas. As regards the project that Renata talked about, uh, the CAPS project, 
uh, 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 toward the excellence of teaching and research in French phonetics. And this project shared with its members, simulated and archived the real protest work for research purposes and preparation of teaching material. All audio files in teaching are not from real case, of course, because of the public nature of these teaching sessions, but inherits aspects learned during research, as um, Renata uh, talked about uh, to us. It's also a joint project between the UNICAT, PUC São Paulo, PUC Rio Grande do Sul, and the Perícia Geral do Rio Grande do Sul and uh, National Institute of Crim Criminalists. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to uh, to say to you that you can um, um, present your questions either in Portuguese or in English. If you present a question in Portuguese, it will be translated and the response, the answer will be given in English. Okay, thank you. And please, uh, uh, I, I, I give the word to the public for the, for the, for the questions. Thank you so much. William, nós estamos prontos para as perguntas, se você está aí. Não sei como é que vai funcionar, mas uh, não estou vendo nada, comentários no meu. <risos> Onde fica isso? Ah, já vi, já vi. Ok. Uh, thank you. Ok. Andres, uh, we have um, Andres and the other ones. Uh, you have some questions already. I uh, first to Andres, then to Julio. To Andres uh, from Gabriel Catani. Andres, does the purpose of the data collection should be fully explicit? Of one might give constant thinking about a specific use while the data may be used for another purpose, example, commercial research. Yes, you're right. Well, we give these conditions in a very broad sense. So we always say that the data will not be used for commercial purposes. For instance, so it will only be used for scientific research and scientific teaching, which means a, 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 a very strong restrictions. It sort of activities within the university, and then the, so we always in 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 the written consent forms we ex explicitly exclude commercial use of the data. Uh, if I understood the question correctly, that's, that's my answer. Okay, thank you, Anders. Uh, two questions for you, Julio. The first one is uh, from Miguel Oliveira. What would then be the option for re replicability if research data is not made available? Well, I, I don't think there, is, there are options, uh, actually, if we don't have um, any sort of data on which we can I don't know, perform an analysis and, and check hypothesis. Uh, it's just not possible. And I believe that's that's what we are trying to, to convey in here is that some sort of data, at least, even the extracted parameters that we have obtained in our research, that should be um, shared. So it, uh, other researchers, they can use different tools perhaps or different uh, analysis to 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 analyze the same phenomena um, but yeah I think that that starts with some level of openness uh, without a minimal amount of openness we, we cannot do that there's a related question from Gabriel Catani for, for you as well how restrictions may apply to extract the parameters data? Can they be considered a type of, of a de identified information as they might reveal idiosyncratic patterns? That's a, an excellent question. Um, and I, I actually started like thinking about that. If we are, if the, the parameters that we extract, they are enough for us to um, arrive at the identity of an individual. 
But uh, it's always important to remember that it's only us, uh, the researchers, who, who know, uh, who knows, uh, who we recorded. So no one else can arrive at that identity. I, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps in the future that will be the case, but I don't think that is possible yet. Uh, and what kind of restrictions? That is a good question. I, I think we need to think more about that because uh, everything is so new, especially when it comes to uh, phonetics. Uh, I mean, open science started with in, in other fields and now it's uh, spread into to phonetics. And so I think, it, I think this is something we should, that I should think more about. There are uh, restrictions, of course, and uh, we need to think about that. Andres or Renato, do you want to comment on that? Or develop on that because and as you mentioned during your presentation that uh, during the question section you could develop develop one of the themes that you uh, talked about at the beginning of the presentation if you want to talk about other points as regards the uh, open uh, um, I think it would be good to do that now Actually, I'd like to hear from Anders why he disagreed that the unprocessed, unprocessed recordings are not a kind of personal data. Can you share something with us, Anders, please? Yes, I can. Let's see if I have both my presentation. Oh, still open. Um, let's see. <laughs> Right. So these are these are. Can you see my presentation? Yes. So these are uh, also quotes from the GDPR uh, regulations. So they define biometric data means personal data resulting from specific technical processes related to the physical, physiological, or behavioral characteristics of national persons, which allow or confirm. Uh, the unique identification of that natural person, such as the face, facial images or dactyloscopic data. And dactyloscopic data are fingerprints. And here's another point. The processing of photographs should not systematically be considered to be processing of special categories of personal data, as they are covered by the definition of biometric data only when processed through a specific technical means, allowing the unique identification or authentication of a natural person. So, so they, they don't talk about, about recordings in the GDPR, but they talk about something which is exactly the same thing from, from a principal point of view, namely fingerprints and photographs. And when you, when you analyze fingerprints, you don't look at the fingerprint uh, pictures. You, you do a, a biometric representation. You create a biometric representation of the fingerprint, and that is what you use. And in the databases with known fingerprints, the, it's only the biometric representation of the fingerprints that are uh, served. And they can be used to identify uh, a natural person. And the same is true with photographs. It's not the photographs which are uh, compared, it's the biometric representation of the face which is compared. So in passports, for instance, for this uh, digital passport, not digital, they call it uh, whatever they call the passports where the, that you can show for in those uh, automatic border controls. Then you look into a camera and the camera takes a picture of your face, but then behind the scenes, this face is complete, this picture is uh, transferred to a, a biometric uh, representation of the pr proportions of your face. And that is compared to the corresponding description, biometric description in your passport. And this, and so I mean, saying this, that because the GDPR ident says that personal information that can be used to identify uh, a person is created in the processing of the data. 
So it means that the, the recording as such is not data. It, you can extract data from the recording. So what I'm saying, I, 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 the example I gave to you, you know, uh, yesterday, I think, is, was that you can't come to the court as an expert witness and say, I've listened to the recording and it's the same speaker. The, the known and requested speaker are the same. Um, and, and then they will ask you, well, wait, wait a minute, how, how can you say that? Uh, well, I just know it's not the same. That would not be accepted, would it? Because what they want me to say is something about that has to do with the analysis of the of the speech. It could be an acoustic analysis, or, or it could be a biomet automatic biometric uh, analysis or a speaker comparison. So it's the, in the processes that processing the data that's when the identifiable pers uh, personal personal identifiers arise, but there are not in the data as such because looking at the photograph isn't enough to identify the person unless you know the, the person of course but it's not enough to identify a person by showing a picture it's just a picture so it's when you the, and I, they use the biometrics because they call all types of analysis of this kind biometric analysis i disagree with that but that's a, a different question altogether so no, the, 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 the recording is not a personal information, piece of personal information. You have to extract that information from the recording. Did I, did I make myself clear? I think so. Do you have a Would like to comment on that or ask again? Can I just say something about that? Yes, please. Um, I think I think uh, yeah, Anders was talking about uh, photograph and, and fingerprints, for instance. Uh, but I think for us, speech is even more um, uh, special. Not because we are phoneticians, but um, uh, it's it's a very it's it's a, it varies a lot. So we we need to think that when we are analyzing some a stretch of speech, we are assuming that is. Um, the individual, but that is the individual in that context is speaking with that person on, under that circumstances, and and we just can't say that uh, uh, that represents uh, the individual entirely. We know how speech is variable, and and that is actually a challenge for us uh, in forensic phonetics to to take to to, to um, um, sort of uh, uh, control that because that's that's actually our biggest challenge is the speech is so variable that sometimes we record the same person in completely different situation. And we perform an analysis, the statistical analysis might say that this is a totally different person. So mm -hmm. I think that speech is um, even more uh, um, um, challenging than, than a fingerprint or a photograph, given this uh, level of variation that we deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think that as regard um, metadata, extract parameters, we consider identifying information. I don't think so, because you have just the metadata. It's impossible. Only, even for us, it's, it's complicated. It's one task of forensic for that to compare speakers with by using extracting parameters and you know that it's very hard to say uh, that the probability of uh, that person be that order five in that order of five being of the same person this is very difficult and you have only metadata i don't think this should be considered identifying information because if you have only have zero traces speech rate etc it's not possible to immediately infer the identity of the person. And for, from our own experience, we have seen that most of times uh, the analysis overlaps subjects. So, for example, for the speech rater, there is an over, over, overlap between subjects that you can it's hard to identify one subject, to connect one subject to, to that parameter. 
It's, mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to find something and like that in, in Julio, phonetics. Yes, Julio showed the, the distributions for the 20 persons for his study, our study. And um, uh, he showed a lot of overlap for several parameters. And then that's, which means that uh, uh, there's a lot of shared um, values. Then that's why it's not possible immediately to infer. Each individual is. If that was the case, for us, it would like to be very easy to do. <laughs> yeah, I would say we are, we, are, we are just not there, like not in a, uh, uh, in a situation in which our model can explain 100% of, of, of an individual. And yeah. when we get there, then we will have to have like, possible solutions for that. We, we can start now by thinking about, about it. But um, we are just not there yet. And this went to, to let me just say I use this uh, example with fingerprints and, fa and uh, face recognition only because I wanted to get an idea of how the DDPR people look at these things, and and in, in their view, my analysis of their view is that the personal information arises in the analysis. It's much, much more simple to identify a person if you can do that at all by fingerprints or DNA or, or face recognition than by speech. So, but it don't, it's the same principle. It's just that speech, re recognizing an individual by the speech of that individual is much more com complex. And it, we don't, in the forensic world, sp uh, uh, forensic phonetics world, speak of speaker recognition any longer. We talk about speaker comparison, so we compare speakers, but we don't identify speakers. So it's not yes. like in CSI you play the file and then you get the, then on the screen you are met, met with the picture of the person, the telephone number. <laughs> yes. All that. So it doesn't work like that. There's nothing like that. So I would say, no, we don't talk about speaker identification. We talk about how probably it is that the speech of the unknown person and the known person emanates from the same source. And yes. then we use like the ratios to quantify that, that probability. Yeah, good but point. Even, even, not even DNA is, speak, is a, an ident a re completely reliable identifier, although it's much more reliable than the speech records, speech comparison. But we talk about, don't talk about speaker identification, we talk about speaker comparison. That's yes. But it's the same, but then, it, I mean, it, if you go to court, you don't go to court to decide the verdict, do you? You go to court to present evidence that can be used together with all sorts, massive amounts of other types of evidence to can yes. come to that uh, conclusion. Yes. It's just one piece of the evidence that you produce, and then it's up to the court to decide what they what they believe about it. And it's not your yes. concern to do that. Thank you for reminding us about that. Uh, the, the persons here, I'm uh, uh, um, thanking you for the presentations. Bob was saying that it was very informative. Sandra is saying that. Uh, to you, Anders, that the, the, your remarks were very insightful, and uh, uh, several thanks to, to Julia's presentation, comments, and thanks to Renata's presentation as well. Um, and people is, are uh, thanking you all for the comments uh, in saying that is very, uh, they are very, were very informative. There are, please, there are other questions. Julio, Renata, and do you want to add something to the discussion? No? Okay. Uh, Just one formal question. Will the Abraham uh, save our presentations and you, or will they be, do they want us to submit our presentations, say as PDFs to for keeping in, in, in their archives or something like that? Mm -hmm. William, uh, Andres está perguntando se, não sei, ou Raquel, que esteja nos ouvindo, ou Miguel, se as nossas apresentações 
é, deverão ser enviadas para colocar como documento e como, é, no formato PDF, por exemplo. Uh, sorry, Anders, I asked the organizers and the, the technician in, in Portuguese about that. I, I don't know if they are here. The microphone. Raquel, Raquel, por favor, você está sem o microfone. Você poderia responder essa pergunta, por favor, em inglês, para o Anders? Yes, uh, you can submit your paper in Cadernos de Linguística. Uh, paper of Abraham. E as apresentações tais como elas foram dadas hoje, tá? é, é preciso enviar também? Raquel. Essa é uma, é uma pergunta nova, vou, vou ver como fazer. Ok. Eu não sei como resolver isso agora. About your, our presentations, and did you um, check on that if you, they would need or not our, the PDF of our presentation? Anyway, we can, uh, you three can present uh, your presentation in the form of a paper to be published in, in Cadernos de Estudos Linguísticos da Brasil. And as if you want, you can present it in the form of a paper. Redat and Jules, the same, the same thing. And to be published next okay. week, next okay. year, okay? Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the public? No? Okay. And I thank you so much for your questions. I thank you so much, my colleagues, Anders, Julio, and Renato, for these wonderful presentations. Very, very insightful, professional informative thank you thank you so much and i thank you uh, the technician william and the two interpreters of brazilian sign languages Quintino and uh, the other one that i forgot the name uh, uh, from uh, their work and allowing uh, the deaf community to accompany the presentations as well thank you so much thank you so much and uh, see you in another event and uh, have a wonderful uh, end of uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.